All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. This sort of soft launch into the morning. Uh, my co-organizer, Mark Marino, uh, and I, as you can tell, put on conferences all the time. Um, it's mostly what we do. No, it's not. Uh, we are faculty in the writing program here at USC. Thank you so much uh, to those of you joining us today and joining us online, um, especially our keynote speaker today, Mahabali, coming all the way from Egypt. Um, <laughs> Maha, they are softly applauding for you in the room. It's a very gentle, welcoming clap. Um, Mark, I think, came up with the idea for this symposium because we wanted something that would invite all of our colleagues across departments at USC and beyond to come together and figure out how do we, oh, I can take this off right now. How, how do we want to handle the future of writing and the future of pedagogy? Because it can't just all be terror of chat GPT and it can't just be surrendering to chat GPT. So we thought it would be useful to come together for a day and figure out what teaching tools we already have uh, that are going to help prepare us for whatever's coming in the next five to 10 years. Um, and what teaching tools can we learn from each other? What does that mean um, across disciplines, across modalities? What does that mean for different forms of access and accessibility? What does that mean for alternative texts, both what we use in our courses and we ask our students to produce? We thought it would be good to just sit down at the end of this chaotic semester and figure out what do we know and what do we still need to know? And how can we orient ourselves towards that future in a way that's not just reactive, not just stressed, but inventive, playful, uh, and above all, interactive. So we have for you a slate of in-person events, some of which will be Zoomed. If those are available, the links will be in our online program in Google Sheets and in the Google Doc that has all the descriptions. Um, we also have a slate of virtual presentations, which folks uh, in person are welcome to join as well. And for those logistics, I'm going to turn you over to my co-host. Mark Marino. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Maddox. So, sorry, I'm just clapping for myself here. So, this is um, yeah, this has been a long time planning. So, before I get into the logistics, let me thank our sponsors. So, this Future of Writing Symposium is sponsored by the uh, University of Southern California Dornsife Writing Program, USC Marshall Business Communication Department. Uh, and feel free to to you know hoot out if you're one of these or another. Um, Viterbi Engineering and Society Program, the Annenberg School of Journalism uh, and Communication. A special thanks to to Gordon for allowing us to use this fine auditorium, this this entire building. Um, USC Libraries Amundsen Lab, the Levin Institute the Humanities and Critical Code Studies Lab, which is what I run, and the Electronic Literature Organization. So thank you to all of our sponsoring organizations. That really is, is wonderful. Um, yeah, we, 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 we applaud for them. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you for them. And, and again, if you haven't sponsored us this time, you know there'll be more opportunities to sponsor us in the future. Um, as far as logistics go, so everything can be reached by that handy bit.ly uh, it's bit.ly slash up, uppercase USC, capital F, future, capital W, writing. And that'll take you to this site here that brings you to our event schedule, our full program, which was put together by Maddox, and of course, the schedule as well. And we have our art ex exhibition as well, you can see. So we've got our virtual keynote starting imminently, starting at 10 a.m., although I believe it's 8 p.m. in Egypt thanks to some daylight savings time. Um, and then you'll see as you move along that then we move into in-person and online workshops. Again, the links to the online ones for those of you following at home are over here. And again, they'll, we'll place them in, the, uh, in this schedule if people allow to make those you know, zoomable for the in-person ones. And then we've got uh, a break that happens at lunch, but that's when our when Peggy Weil will host our virtual exhibition. So that'll also so for those of you who are here, you can grab your lunch and come back into this room, and you can you can watch that session happening, or you can you know use the time to actually take a break if you would like. And then we have our in person plenary with Jeremy Douglas, who's right here, and. And during the in-person one, also there are a couple of uh, online sessions that'll be happening. And then we have our online plenary given by Anna Mills. And that again, for those of you who are here who wanna see that, you can come back to this auditorium. 
And then there's some in-person sessions that happen here, including my own. And then at four o'clock, we have a last row of sessions that are both in-person and online. And then because the future of writing uh, is like the past of writing, you know, like the MLA, it includes cash bars. So then people can go to Rock and Riley's where there is an unsponsored cash bar that happens all the time, apparently at Rock and Riley's. That's Do they take there. Bitcoin at Rock and Riley's? That's that's their I don't know. That uh, Yeah, that's a good question. That's their bread and butter. That's good. That's a, uh, okay, so let's see what else we got. So, uh, and and um, my program director, Nora Ash McNally has just come in, which is great because she's also another founder of the Feast. So thank you for, for coming and for sponsoring this event. Um, our hashtag for today, we've decided is future, if, if people are still on things that are hashtagable, is future, future writing. So if you want to use that. Also, if you haven't yet joined the Discord, the Discord uh, in, invite link is, uh, it's also a bit.ly, bit.ly slash future writing discord, all lowercase. So future writing discord will get you there. And that's that's our virtual space that has lots of channels. It has channels for the in-person sessions, for the plenaries, for Q&A. And also we're hoping that that'll become a space that everyone will use going forward uh, to continue these conversations. So uh, there's also like a little coffee talk area uh, that I, I'm very fond of, um, coffee or tea uh, or other beverages as well. Okay, all right, let's see. We're, we're almost done with our little... Uh, elaborated intro. Oh, I also want to thank, even though they're not here in the room, I want to thank our writing program uh, staff who have helped out tremendously with this, including especially Lillian Lamb, who's responsible for the coffee and refreshments. We have a plenty out there. Folks who are watching online, if you have a way to get here, there's a, <laughs> there are a lot, a lot of refreshments awaiting you. Uh, so don't don't just sit all cozy in your jammies when you could wear your jammies here. And if the coffee. pedagogy doesn't get you, the snacks will. Indeed, indeed. Uh, and also Jasmine Robledo, I want to thank her as well for for re really helping out. And of course, all the student workers who helped making copies and walking around campus and posting them and things like that. Um, okay, so just a few last little things. Um, so so my my little spiel I just want to throw on this is uh, in, in this moment. When AI has captured all of our attention from, from administrators to students, can we lean into what makes us unique? Our ability to think critically, treat each other with compassion, welcome and include with equity. In other words, why can't the future of writing be born of our humanity or as it has been called by others, our post-humanity? So again, keep this is gonna be a long day of conversations. I'm really excited about it. I'm really grateful to all those of you who are here attending virtually and in person. Uh, and and then one more small thing I wanna say, which is the future of writing, uh, when, when, I, when I come to think about this, there is no person on earth who I'd rather think about this with than Maddox, who has been such a great collaborator, such a, such a great uh, co-chair of this whole event. And, and certainly gives me a lot of hope for the future of writing as well. So thank you, Maddox, for tire. tire thank you, Mark. Do you want to ask everybody to do like a little brainstorming and then start Maha right at 10? A little brainstorm? Yeah. What, like what like kind of brainstorm? So I would, one thing I experience as a teacher who sometimes takes classes is the way that like doctors are the worst patients. I think sometimes teachers are challenging students. So I would love for everybody to take these five uh, minutes so that we can let folks join and start with Maha right at 10. Uh, what are questions that you want to be looking for the answer to today? Do you have materials? Do you have a specific activity? What are the things that stress you out about AI and the future of writing and pedagogy or coming back to the classroom after this long Zoom interlude? What are the things that you're hoping to find out today. I would love for you to take these five minutes in addition to like getting a last cup of coffee, getting a snack, but just take a second to like write some down. So at the end of the day, when we're all huddled up at Rock and Riley's or Discord, um, we can share what we found in answer to those questions. And folks who are online, you can do that in the chat or you can hop on the Discord, which is a great place. Hey. Yeah. So we'll see you back here in five minutes. Thanks so much, everybody. Um...
All right. Good morning again, and welcome back. Folks on the Zoom, can you hear me now? I'm trying to get to the bottom of the chat. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Great. Uh, so welcome back. Welcome to those of you who are joining us. Everybody is dropping in the chat where they are coming from. We got Savannah, we got Brooklyn, we got Cape Town. Those are just a few that I saw. Um, I'm so excited to introduce our keynote speaker for today. I will minimize this chat once we get going. Um, Mahabali is a professor of practice at the Center for Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo. She has a PhD in education from the University of Sheffield in the UK. She co-founded Virtually Connecting, a grassroots movement that challenges academic gatekeeping at conferences. Also, Bali is a co-facilitator of Equity Unbound, an equity-focused, open, connected, intercultural learning curriculum which is also branched into academic collaboration with 1HE, Community Building Resources, and MyFest, an innovative three-month professional learning journey. All those links um, are in her bio in the uh, spreadsheet with the schedule and our program. We are so excited uh, to have her share her talk today about equity, collaboration, and access. Take it away, Maha. Thank you so much, Maddox and Mark, for having me. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, I like to start with assalamu alaikum. This means peace be upon you. It works for any time of day. It works for high and by. So this works great because it's 8 p.m. for me and morning time for y'all in California and people from everywhere over here. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. I put the link to my slides, but this, my, this time I made a mistake and put the link to the Discord in the chat. But anyway, I'll put a link to, to my slides in the chat again. And then if someone could help me out by any links that I post in the chat, if someone can put them in the Discord on the channel for my keynote, that will make it easier for me to just keep going. All right. So whoever wants to volunteer and say that, do that. Um, or you can distribute it, I guess, <laughs> amongst yourselves. All right. So today, I am going to talk about an equitable community oriented approach to AI and education. Um, I talk about community and equity all the time. Uh, recently started talking about AI and Mark found my stuff on Twitter and this is how we met and that's how I guess I ended up here. Uh, so I'm Bali underscore Maha on Twitter. If you'd like to tweet anything from my slides, you can do that as long as you attribute and you don't sell the stuff. You can do whatever you want with the slides and you can also comment on them later. But before I start um, talking with my keynote, I would like ask you all how you're doing. And I'm going to be using Mentimeter today because this makes it easier for folks in the room and online to all participate in the same space. So if you're in the room, the QR code is at the bottom left. If you're anywhere, actually, the QR code is on the bottom left and you can, with your phone, get there. Or you can just go to menti.com and the code is 51047219. And I see a couple of people have already started responding. And tired is the biggest word. It's that time of semester. Thank you for being honest about that. Apprehensive, excited, meh, irritable, hopeful. That's good. Worried. You can put more than one, maybe two feelings, right? Busy, fine, ready, cheerful, intrigued. Uh, tired is still the biggest word. <laughs> Curious, everything's too much. Yeah, it is. Conflicted, I feel you. Listening, overwhelmed, not bad, awake, engaged, stressed, caffeinated, that's always good to hear, <laughs> pensive, sleepy, depends what time of day it is for you, and relieved, and that's good, that was kind of unexpected, all right, I will move on from here. Thank you all for participating in this. I'm definitely tired, curious, and excited are the biggest ones we've got today. So I will go back to my slides for a little bit and come back to Mentimeter again throughout the session. Um, I, I don't like to just talk. I like to listen to you all as well. And there's a part here where I'm just bringing in things, conversations have been happening on Twitter. Um, I can't really do a land acknowledgement because I'm not in a country where we do land acknowledgements and I'm not there in the US, but I just wanted to bring this up if we're talking about equity. It's important to talk about how coloniality survives colonialism. It's maintained alive in books and criteria of academic performance, cultural patterns, common sense, self-image of peoples, 
aspirations of self, so many other aspects of our modern experience. And in a way, as modern subjects, we breathe coloniality all the time and every day. Being here with you, speaking in English, my non-native language. I'm very fluent in English, which makes me very privileged to be able to talk to you all. But it's important to acknowledge that this is the only way I can have the power to have a conversation with you all. Um, and also the ways in which educational technology as a whole and AI sort of perpetuate some of this coloniality. So just something to keep in the back of our mind. And so we just did the checking in of how you are. I'll do a quick chatterfall with Mentimeter. And then I'll talk to you about the equity care matrix and intentionally equitable hospitality. These are um, papers and, and research I've been doing with colleagues for a few years now. And then what about cultivating community and trust and nuanced conversations around that with AI, creative ways of incorporating AI, including some from UNESCO that just came out recently, and critical AI literacy and the value of uh, open and global conversations. So this is the link to my slides, which I will put in the chat. And I hope I, I already put those on Discord, so it should be all right. Thanks, Anna. And um, open for commenting. So even after today, right, you can you can go back and comment on them later. So I read this in a very unexpected place. This is a book called Purification of the Heart by Hamza Yusuf. Um, and it's a, it's a spiritual book, but this really got to me. And I thought it was really appropriate for today <clears throat> that the heart is centered slightly to the left of our bodies. Two sacred languages of Arabic and Hebrew are written from right to left toward the heart, which as some have noted, mirrors the purpose of writing, namely to affect the heart. Now, I, I don't know that Necessarily every piece of writing has the purpose <clears throat> of affecting the heart, but that type of writing that has the purpose to affect the heart is the type that I think, I hope we will never <laughs> want AI to do for us. But I think maybe there are other types of writing that we're okay <laughs> for AI to do for us. So just starting off with this uh, sentiment. All right, and I will go back to Mentimeter and ask a couple questions just to see where we're at in terms of how everybody is feeling about AI these days. Um, and even actually before I ask about AI, I want to know what nourishes you lately? So this is not an AI question. What's been nourishing you lately? Wow, people are very quick with the answer. Poetry, dog, restful sleep, partner, other people, daughter, fitness, friends, people, again. Fiction, sleep, family, books and conversation, collaboration of opportunities, talking to people, spending time with them. Yeah, me too. Parenting, your child, definitely for me too. Your strength, new connections, for me too. Hugs, big time. Ever since I started hugging people again, I think my well being has like doubled, <laughs> proved a lot. Love and positivity with daughters. Spring, yes, yeah, spring and flowers for whoever has spring right now. Oops, sorry, did not did not mean to do that. One second, okay. Sorry about that. Ooh, I keep I keep going back. I'm sorry about this. What else? Walking, yes, me too. Time with friends, music, walking in nature, meditation, creative experimentation. All right, it wants to move. So I'll just move on to the next question. But thank you all for sharing what nourishes you. All right, what about this one? I, I'll assume that a lot of people in the room have done something cool with AI lately. But if it's nothing, you can also say nothing. But what's the coolest thing you've done with AI recently? Oh, music. Yeah, I like doing yeah, I was yeah, music. Create a rubric. Yeah, laughing at it. Okay. As to write your syllabus as an escape room. Oh, that's so cool. I want to see that one. Make posters for the symposium. Afraid to use it. I understand. Um, video art, classroom exercise that gets students thinking. Oh, that's cool. Experimented with my students, asked how they used it. That is always an interesting conversation because they they use it in ways that I don't expect. Image generation is, is quite fun to play with. Um, new avenue for your own art, yeah. New twine project with mid-journey images. Ooh, that's very interesting. Uh, written scholar bios in the style of Tiger Beat magazine. I've never read that magazine, but now I'm interested. <laughs> Check to see how it writes your assignments. Yeah, that's. I think that's a good exercise, right? Oh man, it's it's moving again. Oh, it'll be fine. It. I am clearly clicking something by mistake. Asked it to write poetry. Yeah, it's not bad with poetry. I mean, not amazing, but 
completing partial photos, structure composing process techniques. Write an episode of Star Trek. Oh, cool. Critique poetry, help clarify argument for a chapter. Nothing other than laughing at it. Okay. Productive argument with it. And wondering about the strange answers and image to text for accessibility. Yeah, and there are other apps for that as well, I think. Okay, and then this one, what's your biggest concern about AI? That I lose my job, and I think people in a lot of areas would say that, lies, cheating, ability to learn about us, reactionary, how we'll use it, that your friend will lose his job or their job, can't keep up, Use it to replace, students would replace their thinking with it. Yeah, that's very worrying. Misinformation, stop critical thinking, that's similar. Shortcuts, right, that are unhealthy. Boredom, and students won't buy into their own voices if they haven't developed them yet, right, when they're younger. Industry-wide misunderstanding, people like AI's writing more than mine, and I think a lot of students might have that thought, and that comes into that voice issue, right? There's a sense of text as a place for intimacy and human communication. Oh, someone's asking me to share the QR again. Let me see if I can do that. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Reductive thoughts entering the discourse. Yeah, again, criticality, inauthentic writing. Yeah, I really don't like the inauthentic writing, to be honest. Making humans boring. I don't think that's going to happen, but I understand that fear still. Um, Weakened confidence of young writers, lack of regulation and biases and so on. All right, it wanted to move on, so I'm just gonna let it move on. What is a metaphor for AI that you would use? And this, I'm almost done with that. So um, my mom, who has nothing to do with AI or education, she's a medical doctor, was saying that AI is like fast food. And that's a pretty good metaphor for AI, especially for someone who has no idea what AI does or is. Uh, and this gave me the idea of, you know, checking in what kind of metaphors. And I think metaphors reveal a lot about how we feel about something. All right, assistant, genie, <laughs> model, calculator, robot, Ikea of writing, so interesting. Mansplaining, <laughs> not yours. Yeah, I've, I've heard that one a lot. Cacophony. That is like having with a boisterous and intelligent toddler living. <laughs> Broken coffee machine, tablet, tool. Mechanical pariah on the living. Interesting. Vomitor <laughs> Vomitorium. Okay. If that means what I think it means, that's funny. Uh, large lying machine with a megaphone. Arguing with someone who has no emotions. Eager to please in turn. <laughs> Teacher's pet. Stochastic parrot. Drunk stochastic parrot. Long conversation with Siri. Yeah. That kind of makes sense. That shanks blurry JPEG. Okay, overconfident student, junk drawer of the internet. <laughs> All right, digital sphinx. Ooh, interesting one. Okay. Yeah. It echoes a lot of concerns I think we've had about different tech before. Someone in the chat was talking about, you know, some of that. Okay, so I'm gonna step away from AI for a second. Well, a bit more than a second, I guess, <laughs> to talk about some other things, and then we'll come back to it again. Um, and those were the questions I already asked. All right, so I want to share with you just to talk about a foundation of how I think about equity and care and community. So the first thing I'm going to share with you is the equity care matrix, which I co-developed with Mia Zamora from the US. We did it originally for open education keynotes. Um, and we asked on Twitter, you know, what's equity without care and what's care without equity? And we curated people's responses to that. And we created this matrix. Um, and I'm going to just go over the matrix and sort of try to refer to it with reference to something related to AI. So it kind of is contextualized. And I've put the link to the paper in the chat. Hopefully someone will put it on Discord. So what we're saying is, you know, if there's no equity and there no, there's no care, that's a systemic injustice. Now, if you have a situation where there is equity, but there is no care, then you've got something you're calling contractual equity. So this is not an AI example, but when you have, for example, a diversity policy or an accommodation policy for people with disabilities, but the people who actually implement these policies don't actually care. So you have the sort of the checkbox situation. Uh, and it's performative, right? It's diversity theater. They do the things that will make them look good, but in reality, the care doesn't actually reach the people who need it. 
Um, and I think in the context of AI, you can have guidelines that are meant to be caring, but the teachers want to punish the students, for example. And so that wouldn't work, even if the guidelines are, are softer or more caring and trying to be equitable, you know. On the other side of that, if you have care without equity, we're calling that partial care. And partial care is partial in three ways, you know, partial as in some people perform the care and others don't. So we have, you know, the teachers who want to mentor students and they carry a lot of the effective labor for that and the other teachers who don't. And so two teachers out of 10 in a department are carrying all the, all the effective labor. It's partial in the sense that some students receive care and some don't because there aren't enough people giving care. So not everyone gets the care. And it's partial as in bias, that there are some students that are visible to us that we care about and others whose care needs are less visible to us so they don't get care. And so what Mia and I are, are trying to sort of think about is how do we create socially just care where everybody has a responsibility to care and everybody gets cared for. And not only does everybody get cared for, but we care for them in the ways that they want to be cared for. We don't give paternalistic care or care that could be harmful. Everyone has um, power and a say in how they wish to be cared for. And nobody goes free. Not everybody is equally good at giving care to begin with, but that doesn't mean they go free without it. And that the ones who care don't get rewarded for it in the ways that we know academia generally is, right? And so socially just care also recognizes that caregivers like teachers have to be cared for as well. And that the reciprocity between us and our students will never make up for that. So we need care in community with each other, with students, and we need our institutions to care for us as well. And I think in the situation of AI, we are all coming out of this pandemic burnt out. Um, I'm an educational developer. So I've been supporting my institution, everyone in my institution for three years now. And now with AI doing the same and they're burnt out, I wanna help them, I wanna help the students. Um, without asking people to go and learn a new tool that they don't know anything about when they're already burnt out to begin with. So how do you balance that? And I think part of it is community with each other, like faculty helping each other in, internally and globally, because nobody's an expert at this point. So, you know, anyone will help anyone at this point. Uh, students themselves and asking students to give us grace and making ourselves sometimes whenever you can be vulnerable with your students. You know, you guys, this is a new thing. I don't know what it's like. Tell me how you're using it and them caring back and being honest and open with us if we build that trust. And then care from our institutions not to impose, for example, things like remote proctoring on us that will make it difficult to care for students and not to impose on us an AI policy that is generalized across all the different departments where it doesn't make sense. And in, in my institution, we haven't done, we've been very careful not to have a top-down approach to this whole AI thing and to let people figure it out uh, on their own. And I think community among local and global educators, as I said, to figure out the nuances of AI has been very important for me personally and for others that I know with our students to have those transparent conversations about AI. And it would be more about where do you think you might find AI useful and where do I think it might not be useful in certain assignments uh, versus you cannot use it or you should not go near it, that kind of thing. And just generally, I think that building community around this will help students when we offer more human support so that they don't seek tools in the wrong places and at times when that's not really the right place to run to the tool if they have human support i think they will seek that human support if it's available to them um you know in a way that makes sense and the socially just care model that me and i uh, came up with is also slightly inspired by this distributed care that is inspired by murmuration of starlings. If any of you have read Adrienne Marie Brown's book, Emergent Strategy, or if you've read about biomimicry in general, starlings are birds and they follow each other. And it looks from a distance like everybody's following the leader, but actually they're not following one leader. They're so far away from the leader. They're actually interacting with six or seven neighbors and adjusting themselves according to those six or seven neighbors closest to them. And this is to say that nobody should be responsible for thousands and thousands of other people. But if we're each responsible, most closely or most consistently to six or seven others around us, then this will ensure that each of us has six or seven people to care for and who care back for us. Um, and I think this kind of adaptation to a few people near us helps with shocks, shocks like big changes to support systems or big changes like earthquakes or like COVID and AI, and also with slides, so slower change like high flex creeping into our teaching. All of these are changes that we're dealing with and we need to adapt with our goal in mind. And I think a lot of the conversations around, AI, oh, how students from using it, how do we do this? But actually, what is it? Why do we teach writing? And those are the questions we should focus on. What are our values and maintaining those versus resisting and, and, and trying to stop this, this new thing 
uh, we should be focused on what our goal is. And I think when you have a group of people that you talk to constantly, I have WhatsApp groups with groups of that size. Um, I have learning communities of slightly larger sizes. These things kind of things help with, uh, with this kind of I'm back. What's the last thing you guys heard? Hey, what's the last thing you guys heard from me? Uh, these things help. So was it, okay, let me see if I, I can share and we'll see if it was. So did you guys see the murmuration of starlings or not? Okay, cool. So I'll move from this then. So I didn't, I didn't miss a lot, right? Okay, so I'll talk about intentionally equitable hospitality. So the book is Emergent Strategy. Uh, let me send that to all. Yeah, by Adrienne Marie Brown. Really good book, which I haven't finished because it's such a good book. I keep rereading the parts that I've read before, <laughs> but it's a beautiful distributed care concept and just to say that in order to the idea of it is hospitality like you as a teacher as a facilitator you have um power as a host of a space and that power is a power you should use to make it equitable for everyone and make it welcoming to each and every person especially the most marginalized and this involves thinking about before you even design a course who do you involve can you involve students can you involve marginalized colleagues um, what kind of restrictions does the institution pose on you and how can you resist these if they're reproducing inequalities? And then when you design, how can you anticipate certain inequalities? Now, I mean, things like using AI, what are some inequalities there? Is that in Egypt, for example, AI was banned, not banned, it was like not a, like open AI didn't even make it open to Egypt. So some people had the digital literacies to figure out how to get it with VPN and things, and some people didn't, and so that wasn't fair. Um, uh, um, some people just find it more difficult to learn new technology than adapt to them, and some don't. Some faculty have time to learn these things, and some don't. don't. These are inequalities that you, you want to address, for example. And facilitation, when you're in the moment and teaching students, how do you adapt? And this Adrienne Marie Brown calls intentional adaptation. The new things that you see, you keep your goal in mind and adapt as you need to. And Priya Parker, in her book, uh, The Art of Gathering, calls this generous authority. Um, so use your power as a host to make the voices of the most marginalized central, right? Because as a teacher, stepping back doesn't mean there's no power in the room. There's still power between the students, right? Power dynamics. And beyond the moment, how do you build community inclusively and equitably in between the moments that you're together? So this sustaining community, I do this with faculty that I work with as an educational developer, I do it with my students. And this is a lot of times how I get to know little things about like how students use AI to write emails, for example. Not something I necessarily spend time with in, uh, on, in class. And it's key here, to, and I'll do this part very quickly, but it's key here to, to notice that people are sometimes intentionally equitable, they're aware of equity and they take action. Sometimes people are unintentionally equitable, their pedagogy generally tends towards equity, even though their goal is like active learning or something. A lot of times people aren't aware of inequities in their class and they don't know how to take action, so they're unintentionally inequitable. The people that I think we need to work with the most and figure out, because I mean, the ones who don't know, you can make them aware and teach them how to do it. The issue is that some people are aware of things like having students with disabilities, but they don't take action on them either because there are a lot of different reasons. Sometimes the institution doesn't reward it or disincentivizes it. Sometimes um, they don't know how to take action. Sometimes they're already burnt out. Sometimes they actually think it's someone else's job. There, there are so many different reasons, but I think it's really important to, to figure out as educators and as educational developers, how do we move more towards intentional equity in all of our teaching and how we're responding to the AI movement, right? And what's happening with AI. And there's no one size fits all response to this. There are different contexts, different goals, different challenges and inequalities. And so I asked this question on Twitter, if cake making was a metaphor for AI, when would it be necessary in your courses or when could you encourage students to bake it completely from scratch when would it be actually okay if they you know baked it from a box like a betty crocker when would you allow them to actually buy it from a bakery when would you um encourage them to just go buy a twinkie when would that be okay um so on twitter 
this is what some people said. And I, I'm sure you're all thinking about this too, but I'll share some of the tweets and I might have too many tweets here. So the main, the main thing that came out is like, it depends on what I'm teaching, right? If I'm teaching cake baking, then I need to, to let them do it from scratch. But if I'm baking something, I'm teaching them about decoration, it's okay if they get something ready made or from a box and then they can focus on the decoration. So this is always a conversation. If you're not teaching writing or language at the very basic levels, maybe it's okay to use uh, parts of your stuff with automation in some way or seeking support in some other way. Um, and of course, uh, what are you being graded on, right? And are you being, what are you being judged on? Uh, what's the goal, process or product, right? And then there's the idea of, you know, bakery would just be plagiarism as we can identify a specific author. If from the box leads to acceptable outcome, the assignment is just poorly designed. So, you know, some assignments are poorly designed. We need to know this. Some people didn't understand what a Twinkie was because yeah, very American reference, but we have Twinkies here in Egypt, so. <laughs> and then some people thought the Twinkie was a horrible thing because they don't think Twinkies are good, but others thought that's a good idea of low thought, low quality, you know, kind of factory type model, right? So if you give a very generic uh, prompt, you're going to get a very generic response from students, whether or not they use AI, honestly. Um, but then sometimes you want students to be able to compare, and I think those are some of the best assignments, which is getting students to write something themselves, do it with AI, compare the two, so maybe they get a Twinkie to compare with uh, baking from scratch, right? And then there's another point about love and care and planning that goes into something homemade, which may not taste as good. Because sometimes it's okay that it doesn't taste good. It's more important that it's homemade, the feelings behind that. Um, another thing relates to sometimes you're in a rush and you have to buy a cake because you're in a rush. Um, and sometimes it's okay to create a mug cake, which is not as good, but it serves a purpose at a certain time, right? Um, and then there's another question of, hey, is it even valuable to keep teaching things that AI can now do? You know, but still we teach our kids to, to cook, hopefully, or some people still learn to cook even though they can order in, right? So that's important. Um, the other thing is that even baking from scratch comes from a recipe, so it's not completely creative. Um, so even if you take your grandma's cookbook, it's probably not exactly the same as how she made it. And then James Neal reminds us not to go all extreme because we're never gonna ask people anymore to go grow, harvest and mill the grain and yeast and sugar cane yourself, right? And then bake the cake on an open fire. Like we don't do that anymore. And I think that's the same as like, we're okay with spell check and autocorrect. So I think these things over time, some aspects of it will become normal and acceptable. And I think that this has historically been happening, uh, but I also think we need to be intentional about that, right? And then there's also this cultural expectation that you disclose whether you've bought the cake or made it yourself. So I think that applies well. And somehow homemade is usually valued more because of the effort you put into it, even though it might not always taste better. Some people may disagree, but <laughs> um, Darcy Norman, this is from Instagram, actually not Twitter, but he's saying, if I was a cake, you'd have no idea what was in it, where any of the ingredients came from, if it was even edible, but it may win a cake baking contest because it looks so good. And I think that was a good, um, way to compare AI to the actual writing is it could it could look good sometimes depends on your criteria right but you don't really know how it made it you know what sources it used um and then this is really interesting because she's like oh what if the cake in a box has metal shavings rather than the cake mix you're expecting could be a can of worms that we're opening here right um and then yeah when would it be considered collusion if the outcome was to create a cake then Using even using a recipe would be collusion. But then at the output was a tea party. So not even the cake, like moving away from the cake itself or even the decoration of the cake, but an entire tea party. We're doing an entire tea party that focuses on the people and the fun and the activities. Then the cake is minor in the midst of all that. And I think that's the case, for example, for an engineering master's thesis, right? The work is actually done in the lab and there's so much work going into it. Like getting the, getting the writing done with AI is minimal compared to the actual work that's happened, you know? Um, and then there's, you know, there was a lot of things about ableism and the ableist assumption that everybody can bake from scratch, that everyone can buy the ingredients, that everyone has the kitchen equipment, that everyone's hands are capable of stirring. And these are really important things to keep in mind. And this applies in general, not just to AI, I think, in the ways that some students need more supports to be able to do something. And then there was another comment before this one, like just about if it's useful in real life, why is it not okay to use in college to use some shortcuts that help? Um, this one also is a reminder that not everyone has access or the same access to AI tools, right? Same for all the baking analogies. Um, 
And then this is another one about allergies. You know, what if it's harder to find certain things that have you know, gluten, dairy, all the allergies, right? So baking from scratch can be easier or more important if you really need to care for someone who has very specific needs. And I think the more specific our assignment needs, the more personal, the more uh, you know, detailed, the, the more meaningful what we're doing, the harder it is gonna be to find a store-bought version of it or an AI will less likely be able to do these kinds of things. And this is extending the metaphor a little bit more. There might be lack of availability of ingredients. And I think this is for students, like a lack of support. If you don't have enough support or it's too expensive for you to, to do whatever support you need, then you may need to take a shortcut. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on from here just because, okay. And this is just Bonnie Stewart asking us to question uh, the way we valorize writing in itself. I think that's a thing to think about. And you know, writing as a proxy for learning. It's not the only way to show learning. And that's important to, to ask. But also, you know, is it okay that we're talking in this way about replacing writing with this? But she also didn't, didn't really like the cake analogy in terms of the not feminist, uh, you know, just like housewives living through the 50s type of um, example. Although, you know, I, I hadn't thought of it that way. So, but it was a good thing to think about. And then a reminder that all recipes are algorithms. So even when we write a lot of what we do in higher education still follows a kind of recipe. Um, hopefully as students get older, it's less so, but you know, moving away from five paragraph essay and, and moving out of all of that into something more unique. Okay, so now that I'm here, let's talk about ways that some of our writing assignments might be inten unintentionally inequitable. And I wrote this uh, blog post with a student of mine yesterday, he was, he's my friend before he was my student. And then he was my student last semester and he is blind. Uh, so he's a disability advocate and he's also just a really brilliant person. Um, so I was thinking about this post and he said, yeah, I think ChatGPT gives uh, making tips, Eileen. <laughs> All right. So yesterday and I started to think, okay, what makes students, what drives students to going for shortcuts in the first place? So one of them is just varying levels of student capability without differentiating levels of support. We give everyone the same deadline and the same amount of time and the same amount of support when some people just need more support to be able to get there. And if that support is not given by us through our teaching assistants, through our own time, through their colleagues, then they're quite likely to then seek some sort of support. And if they don't think they can figure it out on their own within that time frame, that becomes an issue. And then, what if there's no pathway to seek additional help and extend time? So we can predict that certain students will need help, but there will always be people who need help that we hadn't thought of. And is there a pathway for them to seek additional help and extend time without feeling like they're gonna give a bad impression of themselves or um, they're gonna get into trouble for it? I mean, a lot of times I think students will take a shortcut instead of asking us for more time because maybe we don't offer it or we don't allow it. And so is that a way to, to avoid this kind of thing? I think also just some assignments don't carry a lot of meaning or relevance for all our students. And I, I've seen this, I gave my students a choice between three different talks to attend on campus in a certain week that my uh, department was organizing. And the ones who attended talks about topics that they were interested in all wrote really lovely personal reflections. And there was one talk and it was the last one of that week. So all of the ones who missed the first two ended up in that one. So a lot of students went to the one that was the worst and their reflections were awful. And a lot more people used AI in that one because they were like, this is boring. It's been, the person had spoken about something he talked about a lot before. So there was a lot about it on the internet pre-2021. So they used ChatGPT and I could tell right away. And I said, you know, it's okay to use ChatGPT, just be transparent about how you used it. Um, but it was because it was such a boring talk, you know, that they did that. The others didn't even think of doing that. Um, and then, then this other element of student agency and choice. So even though I gave them choice in this one, they still ended up in that place because they just made a bad choice. So there's also the element of teaching that critical thinking skill of how do you make the right choices for yourself. Uh, and as some people said in, in the Twitter, you know, grading products versus process or progress. So of course, if I buy a ready-made cake from a bakery and I'm not a good baker, that cake is gonna taste better. So if it's more about how good the final cake looks like and tastes like, then it's actually better for them to buy it from somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I mean, ethics aside, obviously than um, building it themselves, which will take a lot of effort and still won't be as good. I'm thinking of that Netflix show, Nailed It. You know, <laughs> the cakes always look awful, but sometimes they taste good. So 
I know in a lot of writing courses, we grade the process or we emphasize the process. Maybe if we remove grades altogether, that would be even better, but I know that's not always possible. And the other one, just that lack of trust and transparency between teacher and students. I, I have, I've had faculty where their students came and told them, oh, this assignment, we'll just do that one with AI because yeah, it's such a generic assignment. And so they're helping the teacher actually question their assignment prompts and how are they gonna make it you know, a more meaningful assignment? So I thought that was a very interesting thing to see. And then just encouraging students to let us know how they're using it. I'm learning from my students telling me how they use AI to write emails and, and do various things. And competitive education systems that don't encourage students to learn from each other, but rather, you know, even if I, I'm pretty good, I know there are other people who are better bakers than I, and so I'll never be as good as they are this semester. So I'm just going to ask someone to help me or get, the, get it from a box or something like that to help them keep up, right? Because we're comparing them with each other rather than comparing their own progress against themselves. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen this, this uh, UNESCO report came out recently and it's pretty good. I wasn't expecting that. It's a quick start guide to AI and chat GPT. Um, and it takes from lots of different sources. So this is a, sort of an algorithm about when is it safe to use chat GPT? Kind of like, does it matter if the output is true? And if it doesn't matter, then use chat GPT. So it's something creative or whatever. Uh, but someone on the internet asked me like on Twitter, um, asked me, is it, isn't it always important that it's true? I'm like, no, not everything is factual. Some stuff is creative, some stuff is, uh, yeah, we're just playing around, you know? But if it does matter that it's true, do you have expertise to verify the output is accurate? And uh, if no, then don't use ChatGPT. But if you can, can you be accountable if something gets missed? And if you can be accountable, then it's possible to use ChatGPT and this, is maybe a flowchart that would be useful for students to look at. Although honestly, my child is 11 years old and after using ChatGPT for a couple of weeks, she came to that conclusion all on her own. Like, oh, if I need something, like I wanna make sure it's correct, I'm gonna Google it and find out the source and verify if it's credible and I wouldn't use ChatGPT for that. So I think students will build that critical AI literacy over time, but we could foreground it if we wanted or let them discover it by doing a lot of things just before, to, just before this session. Um, I was with I was with some graduate students and um, showcasing things, and they got to see the chat GPT hallucinate, and they came out of that session. Oh, it's not very accurate. <laughs> okay, so um, so if we think about critical AI literacy, there are four aspects of it. I think that we we can focus on you know this knowing and understanding how it works. I think using and applying it in critical ways, evaluating and creating things with it, and recognizing the ethical issues. Um, and this is a diagram that I created. I think it's useful for students to learn how it works. I let them play games like quick draw to understand pattern recognition. It's different, of course, than large language models, but just seeing how it just learns from things and develops its own uh, knowledge base based on data. It's important for them to understand the qualities of access to, to it, the bias in it. It's, it's been trained on data by white male Western, for the most part, internet type of stuff that doesn't represent all parts of the world. Um, and the ethics of it, I don't know if everybody knows here, but in order to create a chat GPT that doesn't swear and create violent content and so on, they outsourced some of the work to a company in, uh, in Kenya. And a lot of the human workers there were filtering the content for us by looking at a lot of awful content on the internet and they suffered from mental health um, trauma and they were not given the right care to take care of them. So there was a lot of human sacrifice in order to create an AI that seems ethical to us. Uh, I think it's useful to teach students about prompt engineering, teaching them how to write better prompts to get the best out of the AI. Um, although now there's the auto GPT things that, <laughs> that just auto prompts itself. So you don't need to have a great prompt and it'll help you uh, with a very bad prompt and it'll recreate uh, the, create into steps. I think it's also really, really, really important for students to know when, why, and where AI is helpful versus when it might be detrimental. Um, and this is something I think I don't even know necessarily. I change my mind about this all the time because I discover new tools and I try new things and I discover things that I didn't know were possible. So I think giving students safe spaces to try these things out, but recognizing that there are privacy considerations here and to being open to students about that. I've seen someone um, uh, say they'd give their students their own login so that the students wouldn't have to give up their own data. And uh, that's one way to go with that. Um, but I think it's, we can't ignore it. There, there are people in, I think it's very useful to talk to people in the market, in the labor market. Um, and even though I think education is beyond, you know, employability, but it is important to know um, how, you know, their, their engineers, how's it used in engineering. And we know, of course, there's a lot of applications of AI outside of writing. 
that have been used for years. It's been used in the medicine field for more than 20 years. I mean, since I was an undergrad, I was a computer science undergrad, and I created a neural network that predicts stock market prices a day ahead, 20 years, more than 20 years ago. So these things have existed. Thank you for that link, Johanna. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm going to put a link to the blog post that I used to create this infographic because it has links to a lot of the things that I'm talking about, as well as that time article. All right. And so, you know what, for years, I've been teaching a digital literacy course for like four years now, and we always talk about AI as we've known for years has been racist, ableist, sexist, brutal with assumptions, and even large language models are like that as well. That's Brenna Clark Gray. And she's also telling us we've trained our learners to write like robots following patterns and scripts and worrying less about content than the fact that it looks vaguely like an essay. And shockingly, robots are also good at writing like robots. Uh, and uh, Johnny Polito, we were talking about this on Discord earlier today, right? So for me, I think encouraging a transparent assessment and disclosure is the way to go. This is what I'm doing with my students. And still sometimes they think they won't do, they won't tell me, but uh, I keep reminding them that it's okay to use AI, just to tell me. <laughs> um, and, um, and this is how Mark and I met, actually. I think he saw my tweet about that. Classist, of course, Mark, yes, thank you. Um, Sarah Elaine Eaton is a really wonderful person to listen to about academic integrity. And she's written about a post-plagiarism post era where she thinks human, uh, you know, determining where the human ends and the artificial intelligence begins is pointless and futile. Anna Mills has had a Twitter thread around that, whether she thinks, whether we think it's pointless or futile. Um, and I think Sarah Lee Eaton has been watching it, but not responding, Anna, which is interesting, because uh, I think you tagged both me and her. And historical definitions of plagiarism will not be rewritten because of artificial intelligence, they'll be transcended. That's what Sarah says. And I have a response to her because I think, I don't think everything she's um, predicting for post plagiarism era is whether going to happen or is it our aspiration for these things to happen? I'm questioning that. But here are some uh, ways I think we can respond to advances in AI with care and intentionally equitable hospitality. First of all, I think institutions supporting teachers with community conversations, I hope this has been happening in your uh, institution. So it's not just about workshops, we've given workshops, but I think having the conversations where we listen to what teachers are going through and what they're worried about and how they wanna deal with it. Um, my institution, we wrote, um, we had a, like a bunch of faculty write what they were planning to do. And I think towards the end, we're gonna ask them to write what they've done and how it work. How do students respond, right? Supporting students critical AI literacy rather than doing a catch and punish. Addressing the inequalities within our institution, at least in AI and being aware of those. And I really hope that we never automate what we care about. I think, you know, we can automate a lot of things that aren't so important, but not what we care about. Um, and this is here a teaching idea. And this is something I've, I co-authored this paper with a lot of a big group of people. Uh, it's a speculative fiction about AI and ChatGPT and how might it have a positive impact on education? How might it have a negative impact on education? This is from around 30 people from all over the world. And we each wrote two stories, one positive, one negative. I'm planning to have my students each pick two of the stories and write their own speculative fiction, speculative future of ChatGPT in their field. Um, and I think that's a useful uh, space to go to just sort of imagine what might happen. I also thought that this curation and crowdsourcing of creative uses of AI in education is helpful. You know, we all need good ideas. Um, and if you have good ideas, it's great if you can share them. So I'm putting that link as well, and I hope someone will put it in Discord. Uh, these are ideas built on Mark, Mike Sharple's work of how can we use ChatGPT kind of like in a role of like a Socratic opponent or a tutor. Someone mentioned uh, sparring with ChatGPT, right? It can be a guide on the side, it can be a co-designer. My boss uses it to create personas for design thinking. I use it sometimes to brainstorm before I do a consultation with a faculty member on possible ways they can readjust their syllabus and rubrics, for example. Someone said they used it as a rubric. Um, I haven't tried all of these, honestly, uh, but you can try them. Take a look at what's in the in the UNESCO document and try it yourself and see. It could be helpful if you're teaching like an intro course where ChatGPT might have enough information that it would actually give students good feedback on it. Um, this one I'm I'm less I'm not sure about, but sort of like where might people use ChatGPT in the research process? Can it help them generate ideas and research questions? I'm not sure about the suggesting data sources since it hallucinates about that. And then with data collection, translation, we've been using that for a while so that you're not only using English data, um, but searching archives and data sets, for some AI it would work, not for ChatGPT, I think per se, but some others. Uh, and data analysis coding, SurveyMonkey already sort of does these themes and topics for analysis with the open-ended questions. So that's a thing that maybe helps students, but 
Still, I'd want them to do it manually because you don't know what kind of biases the AI brings into these things, right? Um, improving writing quality and reformatting citations and references and translating, these are things that could help a lot of people, especially in disciplines like, um, again, I'm thinking like engineering and business where they are not writing all the time, the actual work is not the writing. Um, so it could help with that kind of thing. So yeah, I, I mentioned this uh, thing about collecting what different faculty are doing. So I'm gonna put this where the one related to my faculty members um, and remind us to sort of build trust with students, encourage them to support each other, include them in the conversations around what institutions would do. My students were involved in the development of the guidelines for AI for the institution. And we asked a lot of faculty to ask their students, but only my students filled out the survey. But the key thing here is to have a lot of critical AI conversations with them before we ask them to participate in guidelines because they may reproduce their own oppression and ask for AI detectors um, rather than because they're not aware of all the possibilities, right? So that's an important thing to do. All right, so I wanna give people time to ask questions, but before we do that, I'm going to, I just had a lot of other questions in, um, yeah, and then the Mentimeter. So I'm just gonna ask this one question about what's a key takeaway for you from today? And let me get, I think people wanted the QR code sometimes again. So let me see if I can do that. I'm not seeing the QR code. I hope you can just do it with, um, with the Mentimeter code. So it's menti.com and 5104721. Here we go. QR code is up again. I'm also curious about the the GIF that I have on the on the side. Is it creepy or is it does it express sort of what's emerging for you today <laughs> because yeah i like it but its name is actually creepy something <laughs> i was very surprised about that okay so i'm taking a look at your takeaways transparency and trust feeling hopeful that's good very hard to develop good practice without a community of practice definitely so much to sit with keep having conversations a lot of information take a bit to go through Intersections of AI considerations with other fields like DI, HR, yes. Love the idea of collaborating with students on assignments. Teaching students critical AI before getting them to establish guidelines. You love the Starlink metaphor. I love it too. Equitable care assessment grids. All right. Keeping human-centered teaching a priority. Like the GIF, not creepy. Thanks. <laughs> Definitely the various intersections of care and equity. Cake metaphor. Yeah, I know, right? It was really good to talk to students about it. Uh, one of my students called it this cut work we give to the AI so that we can focus on the creative work. Yeah, power of good analogy, I'm glad you guys like the cake. I'm sorry I didn't give you guys time to give your own perspective on the cake, but I think I had so much from Twitter already, but, you know, uh, definitely use that conversation again if you find it useful. Cake versus pie. I love pie. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe compares, but maybe not even cake. Maybe people are diabetic and they shouldn't be having sugar at all, and maybe we should offer them fresh food that's healthier. Um, general theme, how to use generative. Creeping's okay, not necessarily creepy. Ah, creeping, not creepy. That's the point. Maybe that's what they meant. Uh, taking questions about equity and AI away from binaries can be so productive. Yeah, I love that you mentioned that. I think that's that's key here. It's not a binary. It's it's not even a spectrum. It's multidimensional, right? Multi-layered. So many different dimensions to this whole conversation. That knows response to AI and education is necessary. Yes, I agree so much. Um, I'm going to change my mind all the time also. Discuss with students, yes, discuss with students what they care about, right? Not assume that we know what they care about. I have so many different ways of throughout the semester understanding what they care about. You like the responses to the cake as well as the metaphor. That's great. Rise the key inside of the extended self. I love that point. Take it easy with students. Yeah, engaging me at a time when I was feeling avoidant. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. We shouldn't automate what we care about and value. Yes, I, and this is key for me. Important to be transparent with students. Yes. Make sure equity remains part of the conversation going forward. Metaphor of cake, great. Appreciate focus on equity and care. Hope it will be carried forward. Thinking about ways of using and classroom open up possibilities. Conversation not in themselves new for education, but something feels new. Yeah, that's true. Like a lot, yeah, and a lot of different ways. I think it's opening up, just making it central. 
okay, because mostly about the product, not the process. So there's difference if you want everybody to be able to use writing for thinking. Yeah, true. But honestly, I my daughter doesn't like cake, but she enjoys making cake. And she doesn't eat chocolate, but she'll make chocolate brownies with me for the fun of making it. So I think you're you're right, but also there's a lot of people who, and I also like baking a lot and I, I can't eat that much. I mean, I don't want to get fat, but also, you know, so I make it and I give it away and it's all those other elements of it other than eating the actual product of the baking. Writing is where your current self meets your future self. If I can help with that, then great. That's a very interesting one to, to end on. Yeah, perhaps bread instead of cake might be better. That's true. <laughs> All right. I am almost done. I just want to put up a space where people can ask questions. Why not? I think I can have the wait. I'll I'll make that work. Uh, Q and A. We'll do a Q and A. Yeah. Enable questions from the audience. How does that? Work? I'm not sure it's working. So just give me a second. Are you guys seeing something where you can ask questions or not? I think it's here. Yeah, here it is. So this should take questions from the audience on the same Mentimeter and you can upvote uh, um, questions that you're interested in. And honestly, if you know, if, um, if you still have questions for me, you can put them on the slides. They're, they're still there. There is a Q&A option on Zoom as well, but there are people in the room in USC, so it might be easier to use this. If you'd rather use the one here, that's okay too. Um, huh. I'll step away from this for a second and just share my contact information um, if anybody wants to connect with me afterwards. So here's the link again to the slides. My email, baliathaceegypt.edu, balia underscore maha on Twitter. And this is actually, if you want to give me feedback on my keynote, uh, also with the slash Bali keynotes. And let's see if we have any. Okay, so there's a question in the Q&A here from Matt Griffin. With so much in the news about AI, just bringing up the term can lead to reactions where people already made up their minds. What are some ways to open up a conversation and introduce equity considerations into the discussion? That's a lovely question. Um, I, I like to start playful. So I like to start playful with metaphors. I think the Kate metaphor is helpful to some people. Um, I think I just asked people, what's your metaphor for AI? And people's metaphor for AI reveals a lot about how they feel about it, right? So there are people calling it assistant and helper and others calling it apocalyptic stuff. Uh, so that helps sort of both um, start playful and let people see each other's reaction so that you see, oh, other people in the room have a more positive attitude towards it than I do. Um, I think the speculative futures um has been um for me <laughs> i had a very negative attitude towards ai like i'm a computer scientist originally but my phd is in education um and uh doing the speculative futures and being forced to write one positive story and one negative story when all my thinking was negative helped me open that up so i think asking people you know what's the potential good that come out of ai what's the potential bad maybe give them examples of in the medical field ai has helped so much with so many things and i think a lot of times, and also examples, of course, of other technologies that have gone differently. But I think one of the problematic things is to assume and to give the example of, oh, AI is like a calculator, because it's not. Because the calculator has a known result. It's automating a process and making it faster. Generative AI is creating something new. It's creating content. And that's huge. That Those are ideas. These are our original thoughts that we thought nothing could bring. But you know, when you think about it, it's just curating and synthesizing and predicting based on probability from thoughts that other people had about the same topic. It's not gonna create something completely new. It's gonna synthesize into something maybe new-ish. So I'm, I'm still, I'm less worried about that, but I think we need to recognize when I'm in a room, I say, you can be feeling two things at the same time. You can be happy and worried and excited and curious and devastated and all the things at the same time and all the things on different days. I think that's important. So I'll say that I've answered that live. We still have five minutes. Um, well, you want me to solicit some questions from the room itself? If they want to ask them out loud, sure. Does anyone have oh, a I got. Okay, from... I'll listen to the room and then there's a question on Mentimeter as well. Any questions from anybody in the room? They're thoughtfully looking on, so Mentimeter it is. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, I'm so happy. I just want to thank the folks who are virtual, who I think are probably more than the people in the room for keeping the chat going. I was looking at that. So it's really nice because you can't see people nodding or smiling at you online. <laughs> so it's really cool to, to see their chats as I was talking. All right. So this question is, how do you see the potential for institutional subscriptions to AI services playing in equity? Are there models of access that teachers could be pushing for? Ooh, that's a good one. That's always going to be an, an, an inequity, right? And um, I, I would say the most important thing in, in this whole institutional subscriptions thing is that very often these decisions are made by IT people without consulting with educators, without consulting with the right people. So we need to build the digital literacies of our administrators so that they don't keep doing those decisions that like remote proctoring and things that Center for Learning and Teaching people like myself and educators who are in the classroom with the students, they have they should have the agency to decide which of these things are worth spending money on. Um, I think one of the one of the issues if you don't do institutional subscription type of things is that some students will be privileged enough to be able to buy their own personal subscriptions. So if something is deemed to be really important uh, for a certain discipline or for a certain group of students, it's probably better that the institution gets it so that at least all the students within that institution get it. Uh, but I think it's the most important thing is who gets to be at the table to make those choices. And I think students would be great to have on the table and a diversity of students, teachers and uh, educators, but educate the <laughs> policymakers and the admins so that they don't keep um, you know, getting the hype from the ed tech companies that are really, really powerful and for no good reason, honestly, uh, to be imposing these things on us. And then the, it's a very entangled situation. Once you have a technology like Turnitin in your institution, people are just gonna tend towards using it. You have safe assign inside Blackboard and people will use it. Like they're you know, having these things that come up for us without us making decisions intentionally to use them is really problematic. So I need to, we need to speak up about that. If you're tenured, if you have power in your institution, you need to speak up about this kind of thing. Uh, there is another question on Mentimeter. Shall I take it? We have a couple of minutes. Sure. There's two other questions. Let's see what we can do. Thank you, Anna. I think so mandating students use AI for assessment stores as if students, are, yeah, and with subscriptions to ChatGPT does not, not risk a student inequality if some can't pay subscription, definitely. Definitely. And I think if that's the case, then we need to grade them differently. So if someone's using GPT-4 and other people are using the free GPT or they're using another tool because they don't want to give their data to chat GPT, because I think there are other tools that don't uh, take as much of your data. Um, first of all, I, I don't think we should be mandating use of students to use, but we should maybe sometimes allow it. But I think when we allow it, then we expect more of our students. Um, I was having a conversation with my students about reflection and what's a generic reflection and what's a really personal and nuanced reflection. And I said, if you give me a very generic reflection, AI can do that now. So I can't give you a B minus or a C plus for doing that anymore. You have to give me a personal reflection and be more specific in your reflection. So um, I think I would actually, the yeah, I, you know, if someone's going to use AI, um, the, the disclosure will help with the assessment. And some people are saying, I think, I can't remember who was the person who wrote this first, but sort of a two pathways. You either don't use AI or you use AI. What I'm concerned about with those two pathways is that some people will use AI and not disclose it and say that it was their own and all of that. So I think maybe just disclose how much AI you use and where and work with that and use our judgment to like, okay, this person relied a lot on AI and they have GPT-4 versus um, some other AI tool. And so that therefore, you know, these are the parts. And this is what I'm thinking about in terms of that. Um, or let them work in pairs. Someone who has a subscription, someone who doesn't, that could be another way. If, you know, if it's something where you want them to learn about AI, then it makes sense. Um, a lot of anxiety about it is really about assistive technologies, Grammarly, Siri, Alexa, da, da, da. Is there a based image of AI that defines it more specifically? Yeah, I think AI is pretty, there's a lot of definitions around AI. I'm not really sure what your question is getting at, but I think whatever you're looking for, look for it. Like whatever's gonna support you for your purpose in asking this question, um, I think look for it because of course AI is much bigger than just these. Uh, I'm interested that you call them assistive technologies because I was expecting you to talk about sort of things that are for accessibility for people with disabilities, but that's not, I mean, I guess Siri and Alexa are, can be that, but they're not always used in that way. Um, I guess you're saying who are assisting with doing assignments, yeah. Um, so you wanted to be defined more specifically, you'll find one somewhere. I just don't have one on my mind right now. 
How do we bring this thought and resourcing to under-resourced education environments or places where administration people with power are resistant? A lot of times you outsource it to someone outside your institution um, or send them stuff that's been done outside the institution, go to free webinars and things. There's a lot of free webinars and things like that. This conference has been free and we need to end. Thank you all very, very much. I really enjoyed uh, being with you. I wish I could see your voices and see your faces and hear your voices. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. Okay, well, first of all, we got some applause, both virtual and live for you, Maha. Thank you for just a really wonderful talk. And I feel spoiled because I feel like I got the talk that I got to request. I, I got a home-baked cake of a talk that I got to. Um, but Collaboratively baked. And, and it, it will be, it has been recorded, so we will be able to share this with everyone and uh really just just tr truly inspiring and so i and I, I just thank you thank you from the bottom of my heart that was delightful um and now i have to switch to some business um uh to direct people various places so first of all if you uh, everyone now we have a slight break of about 15 minutes where some people are setting up for people here in person there are folks setting up in their classrooms um to be honest, it is not too late if you decide to, you want to make your session Zoom available, just email uh, or come grab me or, or grab Maddox and we can add that to the schedule. Um, and then for folks online, you know, you can take a look at the schedule to see what's available virtually. Or of course, we've got all these virtual sessions that are starting up right now. Um, there is for people here in person, there's actual coffee and tea and refreshments still out there for folks who are online. You can imagine that there are some that are being distributed via uh, discord. I, I think discord may literally leave cookies on your desktop. So if you can pardon that pun, that would be great. Um, and again, here's, here's the rest of the schedule, just looking ahead. And then we've got our lunch break that happens uh, at uh, 1230. And then we got our plenary in person plenary that is also going to be streamed. And then we get our um, a little break at 2.30 and then our three o'clock and four o'clock sessions. So uh, one, once again, I don't know, it's because we have nothing else to do. Let's give another round of applause for Maha who might may not be there. And then uh, and I'll see you guys all in sessions shortly.